<laughs> Good afternoon. Those of you who are watching us live, we apologize for our delay here. We had a lunch and uh, there was a number of people we needed to finish. Uh, it is one, uh, uh, I just wanted to introduce one more time Scott Fritzema, who is uh, director for the Belt of Truth Ministries and also a vice president and co-founder for Liberty and Health Alliance. We are so glad that he's with us today and um, you will get information about the material that he's going to have from him directly through this presentation. At the same time, uh, uh, those of you who are present here, I hope that you will stay all the way to the end, that you would be able to obtain that. I believe also that, you, as you always do, you will begin with a prayer, the same session here in afternoon. Those of you who are watching us live, I know that last Sabbath many of you commented and enjoyed the baptism that we have. Our another baptism is going to be in two Sabbaths, November 5. So uh, if you want to join us online or in person, our baptism is going to be on November 5. May God bless us all as Scott Ritzema is going to lead us to the truth and nothing else, but only the truth. Thank you. Thank you, Pastor John, and let's do that. Let's begin with prayer, shall we? Father, we are so thankful that we can come before you on this Holy Sabbath day and seek an understanding of current events and prophecy from, from the biblical, heavenly perspective. And so we ask your spirit to lead and guide our thoughts and the information we're going to cover, that we may be uh, aware and awakened uh, that the time is near and even at hand. And we just pray that you would... Um, Help us to have ears to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, here we are for our afternoon session number one of two. And uh, I believe the second one that's going to be at four o'clock central time has to be very punctual in order for the live stream to work or something like that. Um, so this one, having a little delay, will be the one of two that ends up with a delay. But as I was chatting with some folks in the front row at the beginning, they said, you know, we, we understand this afternoon is about current events and prophecy, and we've seen a series you did on that topic years ago called Second Beast Rising, and that is still as relevant now as it was when it first came out. It's, it's quite astounding. I was going back and reviewing some of the content from that that you think is old and stale and from 2016 and 17. What about that could be potentially and possibly relevant today and like everything? <laughs> it, is, it is astounding how the events that were already beginning to transpire then were building toward the world in which we live now. Um, for example, uh, we were talking already at that time about the breakdown of the European Union and how Daniel 2 foretells that you're never going to have a cleaving of Europe, a European super state and how much more relevant that is now when you look at the euro currency this year. By the way, if any of the economic, political science, geopolitical stuff that's, that's here and there is like over anybody's head. Don't worry about it because we'll always bring it back to the simple things of what's going on. You're like, I don't know what's going on with the euro currency. You don't have to follow current events necessarily as closely as a current events and prophecy guy might. So you'll pick up some interesting things that show that the time is near. The signs of the times are hastening as, we, as the, the, the Lord's coming is even at the door. And so technocracy basically is a follow-up to Second Beast Rising in that way because we're dealing with current events and prophecy. But the conversation up on the front row here was interesting because the question was, are you going to be doing any follow-up information to Second Beast Rising? And I said, oh boy, with my yellow notepads, I have done a bad job with keeping everybody in the loop because email is our main way of communicating. If you aren't on our e email newsletter, I mean, I'm just not good at social media. I just don't do that that well. I can write a, I can write a newsletter. I can send out a mass email. For three or two years now, we've been having a series coming out called COVID Dystopia. So that was definitely the follow-up to Second Beast Rising. Like, you didn't know about that. No, I didn't know about that. I am sorry. COVID Dystopia. Did anybody in here know about COVID Dystopia? Okay, we got a few people who are in, in the loop. Um, 
yeah, talking about religious liberty and, and current events, talking about prophecy and current events during the COVID times. But technocracy was supposed to come out in 2020. Um, some of you who've been following the development of the media seminars, we were doing media on the brain all those years, 2012, 13, 14, and then the media mind in 2019. But the problem with the media mind is it came out in 2019 with some lingering things that we didn't incorporate into the media mind. Things involving social robots and AI and algorithms and big tech manipulation censorship and the wiring of, the, 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 of our brains into the cloud and all this crazy sci-fi future. We're like, you know what? The media mind is complete. It, it, it was full. And we said, we're going to postpone that to next year and we'll do a series called Technocracy next year. That was 2020. Why do you think we didn't do Technocracy in 2020? If you're doing current events and prophecy, it's all COVID all the time, right? So that was kind of the focus that year on what is the Lord telling us during these difficult, difficult times. Um, so that's hence the uh, delay on technocracy coming out. But boy, am I glad that it was a delay. Um, reason being, let me give you the titles of the technocracy series of which we are doing little bits and pieces in this session. This is a 10-part series, so we're only able to touch on it. Uh, but the, one, the name I gave you this morning for what we're going to talk about this afternoon is The Greater Reset, The Blessed Hope. Then there's one called Deprived by Design, Dark Ages, Feudalism Strikes Back. We'll touch a little bit on that, that one this afternoon. The Chaos Strategy, Economic Catastrophe, War, and Civil Unrest. Again, with Second Beast Rising, we were talking about war and wars and rumors of war. We were talking about Ukraine as a, as a hot spot for a potential jump point into wider war and things that we'd rather not speak of, um, the signs of the times. Servants of God or slaves to the algorithm, uh, that is the idea of big tech controlling and the algorithm ruling and free will being surrendered unto the Google, which knows us so much better than we know ourselves. Meta immersed, have you heard of the metaverse? Meta immersed, obsolete and non-essential. Why the future doesn't need humans. And that became all the more relevant during COVID times when employment uh, sectors were deemed non-essential and declared as non-essential. We're referring to now human labor that way as non-essential, and we become immersed in a metaverse, in an online experience. Now, I gotta tell you, with four and five and six and seven and eight, we're basically not even gonna scratch the surface of those today. We're gonna to hit a lot of one and two and 10 and a little bit of three. But um, these, the, the, the central section here of technocracy, uh, parts four, five, six, seven, and eight, that was why I was so glad and just praising God and saw the providential leading of God that we did not develop a technocracy series in 2020 because in 2022, there have been more announcements about what kind of we you know, uh, su suspect, su suspected was coming. Sorry, that word took a second. <laughs> what, we thought, what we thought might be coming, what we, what we imagined might be coming, what was kind of whispered out there, and it became announced and shouted from the rooftops. What kind of things? Well, things like counterfeit creation, social robots in an age of social distance, the metaverse, what the World Economic Forum is telling us about that, human 2.0, media in the brain, the great merge, and the God delusion, the idea that we can become gods. I can't say too much about these things or I'll spend the whole afternoon just telling you what's in those and then we'll never get to the content of the afternoon. But uh, I, will, I will mention that this idea of the spiritual machines becoming a, a completely surrendering to and the literal worship of artificial intelligence is coming. And I know some of the things in technocracy are going to sound crazy, but it's just what they are saying. It would never be some speculation of some person. It needs to be documented if we're going to do current events and prophecies prophecy responsibly. Um, number nine is the high-tech thought police, and then 10, the climactic climate crisis. So having said all of that, of what we're going to be touching on this afternoon, I want to begin with a clip. Now, this is going to be our test because we're doing things a little differently with our uh, AV department. There's no sound from my computer, so we switch over from mine to the house computer, and the, and the video will play for the, for the group in here and those online. And so hopefully it will be a pretty quick transition each time we need to go to a clip. We'll see how it goes. But I want you to hear from a farewell address from a former president of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower. Dwight D. Eisenhower. In the councils of government, we must guard against the acquisition of unwarranted influence, whether sought or unsought, 
by the military-industrial complex. We must also be alert to the equal and opposite danger that public policy could itself become the captive of a scientific technological elite. So if a scientific technological elite were to capture public policy, in other words, engage in social engineering upon a society according to the dictates of that very elite, that would be broadly defined as a technocracy, no longer a society of freedom with the two lamb's horns, civil and religious liberty in the American constitutional republic. It would transition from that to rule by the technocratic elite, by the technicians, by the experts, by those who hold those positions of corporate and bureaucratic power. That was something that was hinted at, what would be that be now, 60 years ago. 60 years ago, it was not only the military-industrial complex, and we could talk about the geopolitical aspects of that, but the main part I wanted to share, which a lot of people don't talk about from the Eisenhower, Eisenhower farewell address, he warned f about the dangers in America of a scientific technological elite capturing public policy. Let's think about that as we go forward and see has that transpired. Well, there's been much talk for the last 30 plus years at least, but also going back to the early 20th century, authors like H.G. Wells and others foreshadowing, calling for, and attempting to, through roundtable groups and other secret societies or just flat out announcements and, and publications from the power elite, build what they call a world government, or often goes by the, the nomenclature of a new world order. Now this was fascinating to me because in, the, in, in 2020, this year, this summer, this is one of those examples about, I'm so glad this series was delayed because so much new information came out. For example, just the announcement of world government. We're going to have a summit called the world government that was a major globalist uh, sort of uh, confab. And at this summit, they, and they asked the question, really made the announcement of what is now here. And I want to roll that clip right now. Okay, we'll skip that one. It goes, the, uh, it's the announcement of the opening session for the World Government Summit, and it's simply the question, are we Finances, ready? Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, a very, very good morning on what is the first official day of World Government Summit here at Dubai Expo 2020. And the title of this session, are we ready for a new world order? CNBC published an article, a oh, new world order is emerging and the world is not ready for it. Are we ready for a new world order? For the new world order is how they put it in the article, but it was a uh, new in the, in the, you heard it. A provoc the provocative title of the panel that led off the ambitiously named World Government Summit, that is a pretty ambitious name, here last week, was framed to suggest that a new global order is emerging and the world is not ready for it. Now, I want to use the World Government Summit that was held in 2022 as sort of the outline for much of what we're going to walk through this afternoon together. Because on their website, they had all these little inserts of, you know, heading and what we're all about. Here's another heading. Here's what we're all about. Here's another heading, here's what we're all about. So if you want to understand the globalist technocracy, you kind of go category by category and you get some pretty good hints and not needing to theorize or engage in any sort of conspiratorial speculation. The first thing is, in highlighted in blue there, they refer to the age of what? Can you read that from where you are? Interdependence, a new blueprint for governments. So we're going to have a different form of how governance takes place, and we're going to call it the age of interdependence. Now remember those two concepts as we go forward, because i got to do a little history for you to get, see how we got to this phrase interdependence and what they're talking about with a new kind of government. Well, I want to take you back just a few years first, and then we'll go back a little further than that. But do you remember 2015, the announcement of the 2030 Agenda? This was a huge global announcement, a major, a new agenda for a sustainable world. And the big wig who missed uh, the UN um, G uh, Secretary General announced it as I call Agenda 2030 our declaration of what? Can you read it from there? Wait a minute. I've heard of the Declaration of Independence. 
I've never heard of the Declaration of Interdependence. What are you referring to? Well, Mr. Ban highlighted the vital need to engage with more com uh, companies to reach the agenda's 17 sustainable development goals. So the 2030 agenda was a United Nations uh, blueprint for 17 things we want to achieve by the year 2030. And I call the agenda our Declaration of Interdependence. Now, if you were to uh, pinpoint one institution, entity upon the earth, and I'm not talking about Satan himself, of course, who would be number one, but who would be most inclined to want to replace the Declaration of Independence with something else, anything else? Well, guess who was the biggest promoter of the Declaration of Interdependence? By the way, this is not a slam on people who happen to be Catholic. All the Catholic people I know are like, our Marxist Pope is embarrassing. That's what they say, okay? I'm not saying that. but So this is not a slam on Catholics. I love everybody from all religions, faiths, walks of life, races, nations, etc. But in an address to the United Nations General Assembly in New York today, Pope Francis spoke at length on a range of subjects from equity and the environmental protection to the promotion of the rule of law and eradicating global poverty. In this, the fifth time that a pope has visited the UN, Pope Francis also highlighted the importance of the, there it is, the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development set to be adopted by UN member states later this morning, that was the news in 2015, and the upcoming climate conference in Paris, where they ultimately got their Paris Climate Agreement, your sustainable development goals. We're going to come all back to all that environmental stuff in just a minute. But just suffice it to say now that the 2030 agenda is really a Vatican project and, 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 at, at its essence. You might say it's a United Nations. Well, what is the United Nations? I mean, it isn't as much of an entity in itself as it is there are corporate powers, intergovernmental powers, global elites, and most prominently the Pope of Rome at the wellspring of that. So the Declaration of Inter Interdependence is on the way in, which means the other declaration is on the way out. By the way, is that just some sort of you know, nationalistic, rah, rah, I love America type of thing to say. In the book, The Great Controversy, it quotes the Declaration of Independence at length, and it refers to it as that grand old document. So when you read in Revelation 13 about the nation that was to arise around the time that the Pope was taken captive in 1798 at the end of the 1,260 years, and a nation that would arise in a place that was not as heavily populated as where that first beast was from, you come to an understanding that Revelation 13 is talking about the second beast being America, literally America, that will speak like a dragon in the last days. But before the verse about him speaking like a dragon, what does it describe this beast as being like? Like a lamb, with two horns as a lamb, as I was saying earlier. So when you look at the founding era, there, 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 there's no period of human governance where you can find perfect human performance. You find that in the Garden of Eden, God's theocracy. You find that in heaven, God's order and rule. But as far as when in the course of human events it becomes necessary to throw off the shackles of tyranny and establish a nation of, of independence, a nation of freedom based upon principles that would extend those freedoms to every class, race, and gender in society, I shouldn't say every gender. I, that, I, I slipped into how the culture talks about the, are there more than two? Uh, anyway, you caught me on that. <laughs> Suffice it to say, America was birthed with that, those lamb-like qualities even at a time of, the, of, of oppression of, of slaves, even at a time where woman, women couldn't yet vote. But the principles in the Declaration of Independence were that which gave birth to extending those freedoms to all. So we celebrate that. We don't just say, well, that was at a time that they didn't get it all right, so let's cast aside the Declaration of Independence. It's that grand old document. Never let that go. We hold these truths to be self-evident, said Martin Luther King Jr., quoting the Declaration of Independence, that all men are created equal, that we are endowed by our Creator by certain unalienable rights, and that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So who else is promoting the 2030 agenda? Well, of course, the World Economic Forum. If you haven't heard of them yet, you have, but you may have forgotten you heard of them because they have been everywhere announcing their intentions globally. Davos, the World Economic Forum, is seeking to accelerate, among other things, the implementation of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development. What is the World Economic Forum? A gathering, or maybe you say the gathering publicly, of the world's most wealthy and powerful globalists, including industry, academia, entertainment. You get the musicians out there going back to media on the brain with Bono, meeting with the presidents, meeting with the you remember that whole scenario? 
Leonardo DiCaprio involved in the World Economic Forum, a lot of big entertainers, uh, not just the musicians and the entertainers, but the big corporate elite, the, uh, the, the big tech executives, you name it. Basically, it's a who's who who gather together, form a consensus of what the globalist agenda will be going forward. Um, I should mention, by the way, the idea of, you know, that sounds like a conspiracy theory, a theorist. When, when I was uh, studying at, a, at the master's level in the social sciences, I was, I was doing a term paper on the Bilderberg Group. That was when they were kind of keeping these things more secret. Uh, the World Economic Forum has just been the coming out, the uncloaking, like announcing the new world. Are we ready for a new world order? You know, that kind of thing where it's not really the, 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 the secret whispered things and the speculations that people engage in. But on the paper that I wrote, I simply wanted to quote the public statements that prominent members of that Bilderberg group had engaged in in announcing what they were trying to build for the world. And uh, it was interesting to engage at that level in academia and, and encounter pushback from the professor leadership level, but the fellow students being like, whoa, this is interesting. Why have I never heard this before? There are whole stories to be told about that. I won't tell you all the story of, of my walk through that journey, but I will point out a screenshot from a World Economic Forum video, Global Elites Plan for Your Future. I would have th thought you'd take that screenshot from some YouTuber who's, you know, World Economic Forum, or, you know, corporate globalists are planning your, your future. No, 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 this was from a World Economic Forum video. Screenshot that. That's the idea here, the globalist power brokers. This is Henry Kissinger on the left there and his, his uh, protege, Klaus Schwab who is the president of the World Economic Forum. He's the one you might have heard in the video clips going around with the German accent. We'll get back to him. But in the 1970s, he was studying under Kissinger. And if you don't know Kissinger, a little bit about geopolitical history, he's the biggest New World Order guy of the bunch. I mean, he spoke of it and, and worked for it for a generation at that level. But um, back to the sustainable development goals. What was the 2030 agenda saying they wanted to do? Here is the, the, in their words next to the red arrow transforming our world. Now, I know a God who's going to transform this world. I know that that's really going to transpire. But for human beings to say, we're going to ascend the structures and ladder of power, and the whole world is going to be transformed. Every nation will be transformed. This would be, if they were to achieve it, the biggest, most ambitious social engineering feat in human history, you can't find a time where that actually transpired. Is this just talk? Is this just utopian dreams? Is this just a pipe dream? Well, let's look at what others have said about these 17 sustainable development goals that include new forms of governance, as the World Government Summit announced, partnerships and interdependence with all different levels of the bureaucracy, with the corporate establishments, and with the non-governmental institutions. What could this look like? Well, part of it is wealth redistribution. When you read through the 17 goals, you hear sort of that socialistic Marxist influence of redistribution within nations and among nations, that's been around since the beginning of the United Nations. But I found an actual communist say something very interesting about the 2030 agenda. This is Robert Mugabe, the former dictator of Zimbabwe, which that's close to my family's heart uh, to, to recognize the nation that was turned upside down and more or less destroyed economically and as far as civil liberties and other liberties go. Uh, my wife was born in Zimbabwe as her parents were missionaries with, uh, at the time they were living there when my wife was born. And um, so they, they understand a little bit about, about Zimbabwe from firsthand experience. But here's what he had to say about the 2030 Agenda. This agenda promises a brave new world. Now, students of history who know a little bit about like dystopian fiction literature, which I don't recommend we read, by the way. People talk about 1984 and or Orwellian society and stuff. And yes, I've been there in, in the past. I used to teach classes on that. Today, I don't, I don't believe in, in promoting reading of dystopian fiction literature. Stick with that which is true and noble and right and lovely and admirable and excellent and praiseworthy. But to refer to something as a brave new world is not paying it a compliment. <laughs> the brave new world was this futuristic society where freedoms vanish and people are under some mind control and it's this, you know, Aldous Huxley's version of Orwell's 1984 of what the future could look like under authoritarianism. He's saying that's what the 2030 agenda is. It's a brave new world. 
He called it a new world, which we have to construct consciously, a new world that calls for the creation of a new, here's the concept, a global citizen. So much of the philosophy of this World Economic Forum, United Nations, Vatican, 2030 Agenda conglomerate is an annihilation of nationhood as we've known it. So you need to take down the individual citizenship concept of a nation, like a lamb-like nation that might for a time preserve liberty, and we want global citizen. Beyonce actually had a video up on her, her uh, website that was promoting, hey, global citizens, we got to get behind the 2030 agenda. I won't play that clip because we're not able to do it all, but here's a George Soros publication, very important globalist billionaire. Um, he called the, the sustainable development goals, the 2030 agenda, he called it another great leap forward. Now, if there's anybody who's a history nerd in here, your jaw just hit the floor. Like, wait a minute. He just called it a great leap forward? And attempting to pay it a compliment, that's like calling it a brave new world, but worse, because the great leap forward was not fiction. The great leap forward was perhaps the biggest mass murder in the history of the world in communist China. The Washington Post even reported on that and, and recorded that history and memorialized the 50 million, 50 million Chinese people who were starved to death, millions beaten and tortured to death, 30% of their houses demolished to rubble. Concentration camps were erected, and it's lost on the pages of history to most of us. This is a concern when we refer to the 2030 agenda as the great leap forward. Um, the transforming of our world was one way of putting it. Another one is UN official Peter Thomas called it a master plan for humanity. Now, there's a scripture in Psalm 146 that's very important. In verse 3, it says, Put not your trust in princes, in mortal man who cannot save. And that doesn't mean that we need to uh, you know, name call and slander and get into all sorts of, you know, re uh, you know, subversive, rebellious type of stuff. We're not called to that as a people. To identify the movements that have prophetic implications is absolutely essential to discern the signs of the times. It's important for people to preserve freedom for the limited time we have left. But put not your trust in princes is a very mild standard to approach here. The princes of this world, the Bible says, are coming to nothing. Paul said that in Colossians. They are coming to, the, the, the kingdoms of this world are coming to nothing, coming to naught. Put not your trust in those who would say, we have a master plan for humanity. We're going to transform the world. It's a brave new world, a great leap forward. Yeah, I think I want to look the other direction. Um, this one, I don't think I'm going to play that one. It's basically a World Economic Forum clip, and this, uh, this, this globalist is referring to um, how, how we want to have, have the elite be trusted by the people. And it was a very strange thing. As somebody who's been kind of clued into at least watching current events for the last you know, 20 years or so, I never heard, maybe this happened before, but I'd never heard the power elite refer to themselves as the elite. And so at the World Economic Forum, they were going, people don't trust their elite, and we want them to trust us more. Um, that was a surprise to hear as well. So putting out your trust in princes. At Davos, a few oh, years ago. Yeah, we can go past that one. Thanks, guys. Um, so World Government, World Government Summit, the second one. Oh, no, this is the original one. Age of Interdependence. I got to dig more into that interdependence concept because I told you we'd go back in history a little bit. We made it as far back as 2015, <laughs> the 2030 Agenda. Going a, a little further back, this concept is not new in the 21st, 20th century movements of, of, of globalism. The Declaration of Independence, Interdependence was presented at the Rio Earth Summit. This is in 1992. It's a very important foundational sort of env environmental one world summit and the major globalist uh, 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 event in, in my lifetime. And in 1992, they had this poem presented, and it was called The Declaration of Interdependence. Now you tell me, will you take the Bible and the Declaration of Independence, which is quoted in the Great Controversy, or, or this, this globalist Declaration of in Interdependence with this New Age-sounding stuff? It goes like this. I'm going to read only the highlighted portions. We are the earth. We are the rains. We are human animals related to all other life as descendants of the firstborn cell. That doesn't, that doesn't add up biblically with Genesis 1, does it? First of all, descendants of the firstborn cell. So you've got 
evolution, which is like, it's science, man. Like, trust the science. But then it's, we are the earth. We are the rain. It's the, it's the fusion and intersection of the hard sciences based on total myth and, and fraud, Darwinism, meets new age nothingism, all in one poem. I couldn't believe the declaration of interdependence had been presented to serious people at this earth summit. We are the earth, we are the rains, and we are all descended from the firstborn cell. In the Earth's uh, Charter, which was the main document to come out of the Earth Summit, they refer again there to the equitable distribution of wealth within nations and among nations. And in previous seminars, and I ought to have inserted it here, I try not to hit content multiple times in subsequent seminars that we do, but in a previous seminar, there were quotations from... Uh, patriarchs and prophets, and I've forgotten the page number, it just came to my mind now that it's relevant to this, we might say, well, I like the sound of an equitable distribution of wealth within nations and among nations. In fact, I do that every day. I give to try to help the poor out, and that's something I believe in. Giving is one thing. How about mandates? How about the forced at, 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 at the point of a gun redistribution like in Zimbabwe? Is that something that is healthy for freedom, for liberty? Is it according to God's design and standard? People always say, well, in Acts, you know, not everybody, not, nobody considered his possessions as his own. So that was like, that was Marxism, you know, in the book of Acts. Well, these were people that were giving, right? The idea of communist revolution and forced redistribution, not something of a lamb-like quality. So to quote Patriarchs and Prophets, it says, Many urge with great enthusiasm that all ought to share in an equal share of the temporal blessings of heaven. But this is not as God has intended for it to be. He intends for a diversity of condition, not because God delights in poverty, far from it. It's so that those who have the means can bless those who don't, and that bond of humanity, that sharing, can be under a voluntary system of beneficence. I, I stopped quoting about halfway through that, and started just kind of putting it in my own words. Forgive me for doing that. You look that up. You can find it in your, in your app. We can use media. Look for it right now if you want because I got to get that quote. That's an important quote. It goes, many urge with great enthusiasm that there should be an equal share, that all should share equally in the temporal blessings of heaven. If you put in many urge with great enthusiasm, I know that that's word for word there. Uh, and then it says that's not God's uh, plan. Um, I liked, uh, Can I use a Churchill quote? Come on, it's a history guy. He's going to have to quote Winston Churchill at some point. Okay, he said, he said, yes, capitalism is the unequal distribution of wealth, but socialism is the equal distribution of poverty, <laughs> except for the power elite, of course, who have the goodies to themselves. Call, they called upon the world at the Earth Charter Initiative. They called upon the world to have a sustainable global community. Global community, the interdependence, the one world, new world order concept referred to there. Embracing a new global ethic is something that we must do, said the Earth Charter Initiative. Fundamental changes are needed in our values. Now, that's so interesting because you would think this is a secular agenda, right? I mean, this is secular humanism, but it's all about values and ethic and even a change of mind and heart. Whenever you think you've seen secularism, pure Darwinistic materialism, that's a bait and switch. The devil's into the threefold union. He's into spiritualism. He's into a very religious seeming movement that thinks it can monkey with God's law out of the Vatican. He's into the apostate version of that so-called Protestantism. Secularism is a ruse. It's not really secular, like the secular music industry where they're saying, you know, we formed a new religion and there's no sins in our religion as long as we can... I won't quote the media on the brain from Jay-Z right now, but aren't you glad I was just quoting it, not trying to rap it? That would be just absolutely above the, uh, below the, the pale. Um, the change of mind and heart? Now, I know about a God who wants to change our minds and hearts, not a globalist monolith that's going to change the value system, by the way, through the schools. We'll see that. We'll see a publication they put in schools after 1992 with the Earth Charter for kids. But, uh, or it was the 2030 Agenda for Kids. We'll get to it. Hebrews 8, God will write his law on our heart and on our mind. And in Romans 12, we will be transformed by the renewing of our minds. That's a change of mind and heart I can believe in. Ezekiel 36, a new heart also will I give you, right? God wants to do the real thing. 
This sort of uh, social gospel, it's sometimes called, or social justice gospel, is a way to take Marxism with a secular overlay, and it's really a method of oppression, persecution, and, re- and negating of religious freedom. And it's a false counterfeit change of heart and mind. Listen to this from one of the promoters of the Earth Charter back in 1992. My hope is that this Earth Charter will be a kind of, what's the next thing? Ten Commandments. A Sermon on the Mount that provides a guide for human behavior toward the environment in the next century. You don't get a higher class of biblical scripture than the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. That is is like God's will from Sinai, elucidated and expanded upon and made practical by Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount. They're going to take that down and have the earth charter as the Ten Commandments and the Sermon on the Mount. I don't think so, but they, he wasn't the only one. Maurice Strong, another prominent globalist, said the, the real goal of the Earth Charter is that it will, in fact, become like the Ten Commandments. And it's not just their quotes. They started to memorialize this in symbology. This was the Ark of Hope, where they put the Earth Charter that calls for all the... Basically, it's the 2030 agenda from a generation past, okay? The Ark of Hope is a 49-inch by 32-inch by 32-inch wooden chest that was created as a place of refuge for the Earth Charter document. And an, an international people's treaty, there's Marxist language, for building a just, sustainable, and pe- peaceful global society in the 21st century. The Ark of Hope also provides refuge for the Temenos books, images and words for global healing, peace, and gratitude. Over a thousand handcrafted books have been made by artists, school children, and citizens around the world. School children, public schools, there's a separation of church and state there, but they're inducting these children into the new age. See, it's not secularism. It re- if it really was, then that would be one thing, but it's in- in- inculcating them with this, this earth worship, new, new age religion. Um, expressing individual and collaborative prayers and affirmations for Earth. The Earth Charter's 16 principles are the guiding vision behind the creation of these books. It became 17 Sustainable Development Goals in 2015. But they had the 16 principles back there in 1992. So they've got these Temenos books. The Temenos, by the way, is a magical sacred circle. This is all New Age occult stuff. And its devotees got very serious around this. They started carrying this box around with poles, You already noticed what the box is a counterfeit of, right? You don't need me to explain that. From the dimensions to the poles to the document that goes in it that is our uh, most important thing, the Earth Charter. Um, They do these, uh, these, these carrying poles where they said they made their poles out of unicorn horns which render evil ineffective. You think, these are secularists? This sounds like the witch doctor and the pagan tribe in the mission story. What is this? This is what they believe in. They erected their own counterfeit Ten Commandments as well. So it's the New Age religion is the counterfeit for God's Ten Commandments from that spiritualist perspective. From the first beast, we have the perspective of taking away the Second Commandment and tweaking the fourth. This is the very much spiritualist Ten Commandments. Have you heard of the Georgia Guidestones in the news lately? I think there was a little bit of an event there earlier this year. But why would somebody engage in vandalism of that nature? Um, They were mad about the fact that the Ten Commandments, apparently, I don't know if they were mad, who knows what actually happened, but as soon as I saw that, I'm like, yeah, that's some sort of like, you know, uh, politically minded person who doesn't like maintain humanity under 500 million in perpetual balance with nature. Wait, 500 million? How many people are on the earth right now? Like almost 8 billion, right? So you'd have to reduce the population by more than 90% in order to maintain it at 500 million or under. And you're thinking, is there literally like a population reduction agenda? That's pretty far out there. Well, the devil comes only to steal. We covered that with the redistribution. To kill, um, that's his thing. He was a murderer from the beginning. So that he hates the Ten Commandments, he hates God's law, he wouldn't, you wouldn't put that past him in a heartbeat. Um, in the Earth Charter, they actually decry an unprecedented rise in human population. And I've got more quotes, I have so many clips, I'm, I didn't put a lot of the clips in, because in a live presentation, clips don't always you know, work that well. Uh, especially with our lag here, we may skip a lot of them, but there's a clip of a World Economic Forum guy saying 
The religious people really don't like where I'm coming from because they want more souls. I want less souls on the planet. And he laughs about it. They decry an unprecedented rise in human population. They advocate that we ensure universal access to health care that fosters reproductive health and responsible reproduction. Okay, that's a bunch of jargon. What is that saying? That's talking about Planned Parenthood. That's talking about access to the so-called right to murder an unborn baby. And Scott, how would you say it in such stark terms? The Bible speaks of the unborn child as a child. So I don't mean to offend because people have a past and God forgives you of that past. So that doesn't mean we can't speak the truth. We have to speak it in love. And we know that Manasseh sacrificed his child. God forgave him and he's going to be in the kingdom, right? So just never forget that if the, if the, 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 the individual walk with the Lord is there and it's struggling and it's shaky because the devil comes in. He says, you know, these accusing type of words, don't let that happen because I know this isn't just a social issue, just a life issue. This is a personal issue for many people. But at the same time, we want to also talk about what are they saying there? Ensure universal access to reproductive health services. Um, that's not looking for the health of the baby. I mean, many people are engaged in that uh, work. We have wonderful obstetricians and gynecologists in that field. They are trying to help babies be healthy. And then we have others at Planned Parenthood type of institutions that are seeking to take the lives of those children. And that's what the Earth Charter was promoting. By the way, you might wonder, why is that DVD up there called Planned Eugenicide? We've got a history of Planned Parenthood in their own words and how they were announcing from very early on that it was eugenics. If you know anything about history and you know about, um, about the eugenicists of the late 19th century and how they were funded by the Cold Springs Harbor Rockefeller Institute in, in, in New York and how that was then imported to Germany, which was then picked up by Hitler. The supreme race ideology actually began with the eugenicists on the east coast of America and in Great Britain as well, with the father of eugenics coming from Great Britain. And you trace that history and you read the announcements, the, what, what is bragged about by the founders like Margaret Sanger of Planned Parenthood. And it is shocking, the racial uh, vitriol and hatred uh, for those that they view as the underclass, as the inferior, breeding for a better race. By the way, can I give you a, maybe I shouldn't, maybe I should come back sometime and do that session for you, but there is a extremely surprising individual that every Seventh-day Adventist would know the name of that was a prominent eugenicist in the early 20th century, hosting eugenics conferences on breeding for a better race and having fitter families. The survival of the fittest is Darwinism applied to society, social Darwinism. Social Darwinism, weeding out the weak and, and, and breeding the strong, and then we can have a better race. Um, uh, he, he, uh, I, I'll give you a hint. He apostatized, and, was, and once he was no longer a faithful, Bible-believing, spirit of prophecy, adhering Seventh-day Adventist Christian, at that point, he got into the New Age and eugenics deeply. Uh, was, a, was a prominent supporter of eugenics. So we go into that history of eugenics and how this is what happens when we stand. You, know, you ever sing the song as a kid? The B-I-B-L-E is stand alone on the word of God, right? The B-I-B-L-E. This is the foundation. When you step off that foundation, you're like, I'm gonna write a book called The Living Temple. There's your clue. And it's about how God is everything and in everything and everything is God. It's pantheism. You've just stepped off here into the abyss of deception and darkness will envelop your mind into every dist distorted, destructive, dark ideology that Satan could ever invent. And I, don't, I can't think of one much darker than racial eugenics. That's about as bad as it gets. And that's what he got into. Um, but also adopted. It was, it was an interesting life because they would adopt the children of the, of the unworthy, of the underclass, and like care about individuals no matter what race and class they came from, but still adhered to that, that ideology. So anyway, um, maybe another time we'll talk, touch on that or we can get into the LGBTQIA agenda because that has a bearing on religious liberty as well. We could talk about how transgenderism actually is a springboard into transhumanism, which is much of the technocracy stuff that we are leaving out today about the metaverse and about what is a human brain and what happens when you wire the human brain into the cloud and what is, a, what is, a, what is, what is life? Is there such a thing as post-biological life? Is there such a thing as spiritual machines? Because AI then could, could become some higher form of being being that we evolve into or we look up to and worship. There's all this crazy stuff coming with the AI side. Transgenderism, 
people are not seeing that link, is a redefining of human biology and what it is to be male or female. That's going to be a springboard into, well, hey, what do we, I, what do we perceive? Because perception is reality. If I perceive an AI to be human and alive, then it is. Or I perceive my experience in the metaverse to be real, then it is real. And so what happens with biological human flesh then? What value does it have? Well, maybe that plays into the population reduction agenda. Anyway, on the abortion side, this was Stephen Clark Rockefeller, one of the council members of the Earth Charter. And in this, you read on Wikipedia that he was a philanthropist. He's an Earth Charter council member and also a big promoter of Planned Parenthood. So it's no quote, no uh, doubt what they're referring to here when they say reproductive, reproductive health. They're referring to access to abortion services. So who is the world's most foremost proponent of the climate change agenda? So if we're talking about 2030 agenda, sustainable development. It's environment, it's climate change, it's CO2. Who's the, okay, how about I just ask this? Who's the most well-known man on planet Earth? <laughs> yeah, you got it. And in his encyclical on the environment, I mean, this isn't about the United Nations. This, this is about the, 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 the heartbeat of this coming out of the Vatican. Sunday rest, he says, also prevents that unfettered greed and motivates us to greater concern for what? For nature. It's an encyclical that he put out all about the environments and about climate change. And he said, what's going to give us greater concern for nature? Sunday rest. Oh, we're going to end there in this session a little later, but... Here's another pope who talked about making laws about Sunday rest. Now, I, I, we, we know that rest is valuable for us. We know that the seventh day Sabbath is the biblical day of worship and rest. But would we favor enforcing and mandating? Do we believe in mandates requiring, coercing, compelling, forcing through the force of law for other people to do what we know is right from a worship perspective? Absolutely not, right? But he said Christians will naturally, like if you're a Christian, you're going to strive to ensure that civil legislation respects your duty to keep Sunday holy. That's a very subtle way, not so subtle really, but of, of calling for a Sunday legislation, enforcing, enforcing that. Um, here's from the International Energy Agency. Here's how we can cut oil use and reduce carbon dioxide emissions. One of the things there with the red. Car-free Sundays in large cities. There are so many ideas that Sunday observance is the solution for, aren't there? Particularly environmental. I've got a clip here if you guys want to run it. It's about how the, uh, the, the globalist agenda here, again, at the World Economic Forum, is, has, has control mechanisms in mind with environmental regulation as the uh, pretext, as the, as the justification. So let's roll that clip. We're developing through technology, an ability for consumers to measure their own carbon footprint. What does that mean? That's where are they traveling? How are they traveling? What are they eating? What are they consuming on the platform? So individual carbon footprint tracker. Mm. Stay tuned. We don't have it operational yet, but this is something that we're working on. <laughs> Wait a minute. Everything I do, every service I, I um, purchase or product I purchase everywhere I go is monitored, tracked, and recorded, and then converted into a number of how many you know, carbon emission units I have just uh, used up. I want that. How many of us were like, please, can I get that? I want to be tracked everything I do about my carbon output. It's put out there like, oh, it's a new product, a new app you can have. Oh, you think that could potentially be used to reimpose as controls, not only just the data, I mean, data itself that we feed into these systems become re, becomes reimposed upon us as controls. But if you give this information to those who are the zealots of limiting carbon dioxide emissions, um, put not your trust in princes. You don't have to make any accusations or speculations. You just ah, I think I'll just say no and just err on the side of caution there because these technologies come in. It'll stop at monitoring. It won't stop at monitoring your carbon emission usage. It will be reimposed as controls. For example, people thought, hey, I'm going to save on my electric bill. Do you remember when this happened this summer? 
Colorado Utility Company locks 22,000 thermostats in 90 degree weather due to energy emergency. They said it's a you know rolling blackouts kind of thing, and you've got your smart uh, smart um, thermostats in your home, and you agreed on your terms of service to save 20 bucks or something on your bill by signing up for. Well, in the event that we have to shut down your your electrical usage, we will do that. And people are like, wait, what did I sign up for? What do I have here? Okay, I've got a quote from Yuval Noah Harari. I don't even remember what he's about to say, but I'll play it in just a second, but I gotta tell you who he is. He's kind of the darling scholar, historian, philosopher of the World Economic Forum. Interviewed, promoted, I mean, there are hundreds of clips of his online, and I've got a lot of them in technocracy. I don't remember what he's about to say. Do you wanna hear it? Let's hear it. Let's go for it, guys. Um, many of the scenarios that I, I outlined oh, yeah. Before the pandemic, yeah. I didn't outline them as a prophecy, but just as a possibility. Maybe it will happen. It's not an extremely deadly virus. It's not the Black Death. And look what it's doing to the world. So now just try to think what will be the implications of a much bigger uh, problem like climate change. Also, conceptually, it shows that... Um, and here I completely agree with you, Ratko, that it shows you that you can change things on a massive scale. That, um, and again, you can stop all flights. You can lock down entire countries. You can actually do that. And uh, life goes on in some way. And this, I would say, may make us more open to radical ideas about how to deal also with climate change. So look at what kind of tools of social control we've acquired through the pandemic. That maybe will give us ideas about how to deal with climate change. Lock down entire nations, stop all flights kind of thing. Car-free Sundays would be small compared to that, right? Wow. Now, um, this climate change discussion opens up a big old can of worms about you know, science debates on carbon dioxide and greenhouse emissions and all of that. I, I don't want to get too into that, but I'll, I'll, I'll show you some things a, a little bit here of what first the United Nations says about global warming. Climate change is the biggest threat modern humans have ever faced. World-renowned naturalist tells Social Security, or tells Security Council calls for greater global cooperation. So do we have a climate crisis. We have a session called the Climactic Climate Crisis in uh, Technocracy. It's number 10 in the series. Um, we definitely do have a crisis of freedom, a crisis of poverty, a crisis of national self-determination, a crisis, you could say, of credibility in the scientific community on so many levels, uh, some of which we just went through in the last two years. But um, this is an interesting chart showing all of the different climate models in all the different colors and what they have been predicting would happen to global temperatures if carbon dioxide emissions continued as they were, which they were. And you see the climate models have radically overstated the danger, the coming danger. I remember in 1992, it was 10 years until the end of the world. And it's like, really? How do you know? Are you sure? Well, these equations and these models we put into the computer, I mean, you remember the models out of East Anglia University in, in the UK about COVID growth and death? And it's like, it, it just was way beyond what, what took place in spring of 2020. Uh, models are only as good as the data input into them. And so if that data is not reliable and, and you'd have no, not a high level of confidence in that, then it's just guesses and speculations. So what you do to evaluate the quality of a model is you look at it retrospectively and you say, how has it performed in the past? Well, how has it performed in the past? The black line is actual global temperatures since 1979. So you can see that at present, it's, you know, it's, it's up some, about you know, 0.3 or a little more than 0.3 degrees Celsius since 1979. And the models are like, woohoo, it should have gone up 1.2 by now, 1.4 by some models. So basically the models are two times, three times, four times or more off from what actually happened. So they're hundreds of percent exaggerating the growth in global, uh, global warming. 
Um, so if they're hundreds of percent off, maybe you say they're 100% irrelevant at that point. Maybe that's, that's a, a skeptical view, but um, you might say, well, 0.3 degrees, I'm pretty sure I've heard about like more than one, 1. 1.5. There is a bifurcation that took place as urbanization continued to grow around the world and, de and developing nations started to urbanize more and more, where you have uh, your temperature readings located in, uh, on land, and which is more, more cement and more urban heat sinks. You get a a spread between the, temp the global temperature as measured on, on, at ocean sites. So that's why this one is going off of sea surface temperatures, that being the more reliable of the two because it isn't biased by the heat of the urban centers. This also is satellite-based in the lower atmosphere temperatures. You can see that's also up about 0 .3, 0 0.36 or so degrees. Uh, the threat of environmental crisis, said Mikhail Gorbachev, is the international disaster key to unlock the new world order. That kind of sums up what a lot of people were suspecting. Like, you know, there are real environmental crises. I think every Christian, every human is an environmentalist at heart in the sense that we love nature. We find it beautiful. We want to conserve it. We want it to be not destroyed with pollution and, and, and ugliness. Um, but when you hear the agendas like, we're going to have climate controls and watch everybody's climate outputs, and it's the international disaster key to unlock the new world order, you start being a little suspicious of what is really behind that. For example, the Club of Rome, a big environmental group, put out the first global revolution in 1991. The first thing I notice about that cover is the iconic socialist sort of looking uh, globe turned red, and it just has that art art artistry to it. But in the book, they said, quote, in searching for a common enemy against whom we can unite, we came up with the idea that pollution, the threat of global warming, water shortages, famine, and the like would fit the bill. It's going to go on in the quote, but just pausing there, we were searching for a common enemy. That's a strange place to start, but pollution certainly is. But the threat of global warming, they put there as something that would fit the bill. In their totality and their interactions, these phenomena do constitute a common threat which must be confronted by everyone together. But in designing these dangers as the enemy, we fall into the trap which we have already warned readers about, namely mistaking symptoms for causes. All these dangers are caused by human intervention in natural processes, and it is only through changed attitudes and behavior that they can be overcome. The real enemy then is the human beings behind all of these causes, so the enemy being human. Now, who believes that human beings made in God's image are the enemy, Satan or God. That's Satan's view, right? God loves us, died to redeem us, Jesus did. So when we hear, we need a new world order because, and every few years it's a new global disaster key to unlock the new world order, you begin to be a little putting out your trust in princes-ish about it. Oil will be gone in 10 years, they said in 1966. The world will use up all its natural resources by 2000, they said in 1970. The Ice Age is coming, they said in the 1970s. I wasn't alive yet. I was born in 1980. Does anybody remember that? I was raised in the global warming in school. That was the big, they didn't call it climate change yet in the 80s and early 90s. But 2,000 children won't know what snow is. Oh, 1989, entire nations will be underwater by 2000. 2002, peak oil in 2010. Let's just say 2010. Uh, in other words, we'll run out of oil. 2008, the Arctic will be ice-free by 2013, said former Vice President Al Gore. Others said it would be by 2018 completely ice-free. So these models, if you will, or predictions have been proven false. Prince Charles said we have 96 months to save the world in 2009. UK Prime Minister said in 2009 we have 50 days to save the planet from catastrophe. In 2014, only 500 days before climate chaos. Uh, which the, the real social uh, impulse, the real love and care, uh, welfare ministry, concern and beneficence for the needy really starts to be skeptical. When you hear statements like this from Princeton professor and lead author on the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, Michael Oppenheimer, he stated, the only hope for the world is to make sure there is not another United States. In other words, we have to keep Develop, de developing nations or third world nations from developing into industrial powerhouses, which is how you end poverty, is allowing development, de allowing economic ingenuity and free markets to grow people out of poverty. And it's what happened, actually. He, he, he didn't get his way here. Uh, there have been 
great success stories economically over the last 20, 30, 40 years. But he said, we can't let other countries have the same number of cars, the amount of industrialization we have in the United States. We have to stop these third world countries right where they are. So we're gonna keep the poor. Poor is what that translates into in, practi in practice. Um, this was the Agenda 21 for children. I mentioned that, I'd show you the, how, how this was starting to come into the schools. You saw they were participating in the Tomenos books, and I mean, you could go on and on with what's in the schools. I could show you a whole curricula that I was asked to teach in public schools when I was a teacher, and I said, absolutely not, and uh, just set it aside and, and, and taught real history and taught real uh, constitutional political science and civics. But um, in the rescue mission for children, they have this statement on one of the pages. The planet groans every time it registers another birth. How does that make children feel? Like, I was born not too long ago. What did the planet do? Planet doesn't like me? I'm a burden on the planet? Um, in Technocracy, there are video clips. I'm not showing you all the clips, of course, but there's one where they showed this cartoon to children in the schools, and it was uh, human beings were perceived as this virus that was appearing and replicating and infecting the earth. And it was like the earth was becoming sick because we have a case of the humans. Oh, humans. And then the humans leave the earth that they have destroyed and they're on another planet. They're going to ruin that one too. And it's just this absolutely diabolically anti-human perspective. Like the, the, the planet groans every time it registers another birth. Um, and, I, and by the way, the Bible says that the earth itself is groaning and waiting the redemption because of this fallen state. And, and to the extent that we contribute to that, that, that is true. If we are being uh, evil and reckless toward, if we de destroy those who destroy the earth kind of thing. So there are a lot of very serious uh, environmental things that we should be aware of in our own practice of the health message and what kind of food we eat and what's happening to, uh, in, in the genomic world and with, with uh, I just mentioned genetically modified foods, that kind of thing to look into and think about and be skeptical of. Um, 1972 Club of Rome population publication, The Limits to Growth. They put this chart in there, and I find it fascinating. 40 years ago, 50 years ago, they were saying 2030 is a key year. Isn't that interesting? 50 years ago, you see in the black, in the black dot, 2030, they said the population will decline following economic collapse. And they've got all these, these measures and, and, and estimates on what's going to be happening with the amount of food and the amount of pollution, the amount of industrial output. And they've got 2030, 50 years ago, they predicted is going to be a time of transition where you're going to have economic collapse and, and that's going to be followed by, um, it's, going to be, it's going to produce population decline, which would be something, of course, that they would not be too unhappy about as you read in their publications that are not promoting human life. Uh, another of, back to our outline, World Government Summit, little snippets here, little snapshots. They referred to building back better. Have you heard that phrase before? This kind of made the rounds, like, I think I heard it like a hundred times. I'm not going to play the next slide, by the way. It's, it's a video of the hundred times build, build Back Better gets said by every, everybody on planet Earth. But what was interesting to me as a history guy is I don't ever remember in following current events or in studying history, one political slogan being adopted by all the nations of the world, or at least the, the West, the, um, the, 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 the World Economic Forum uh, sort of orbit here. Um, the, the Europe, the West, Australia, New Zealand, et cetera, US, Canada. Uh, Build Back Better was everywhere all of a sudden. Like, where did that come from? Uh, there, there must be a common uh, origin of this. I don't think everybody was just like, one day, I think that sounds cool. Me too, me too, me too. No. This, this was some talking points that you get. Building back better, which is another way of referring to what the World Economic Forum calls a great reset. Uh, this session is called The Greater Reset, right? The Blessed Hope. Um, in, on their YouTube channel, by the way, they're very public about things. You can watch endlessly watch World Economic Forum videos. I don't actually recommend it. It's going to be a giant waste of time to watch thousands of World Economic Forum videos from the last 10 years. But on their YouTube page, do you find anything interesting about the graphic imagery used here? It's, the earth is a puzzle and it's being put back together here. And the robotic hand. Oh, if we could only do those five sessions in the middle that I was telling you about with AI. We just don't have time to do it all today. But... That's interesting. The, ro the robot is participating in it. It's hands of all nations putting the earth back together, remaking the planet with the help of AI, building back better, great reset. 
um, they also refer to the new normal. I remember hearing that a lot during COVID. Like working from home, doing school from home, living online to a great degree is the new normal. The new normal. Social distancing is the new normal. The new normal. Not having freedoms is the new normal. The new normal. They kept saying that phrase over and over and over again. And when I saw the image there, it's kind of hard to see with that purple overlay, but do you see people with the VR goggles on? Um, I just a brief mention of the metaverse because you got to understand what's coming. World Economic Forum announced in a different publication than the one on the screen, that's the World Government Summit, they said the metaverse is going to be where we live and work and study and play. It's going to be our new universe. It's called the metaverse. And you might say, well, this is some kind of you know, tech pitch that somebody's putting out there. Facebook changed the name of their company to meta platforms. They are wanting to be the ones that dominate the metaverse. What is the metaverse? It's a counterfeit reality. Scott, I've heard you use that phrase before. Haven't we already had the counterfeit reality around? Yeah, with video games, you go into the massively multiplayer online role-playing game and you're acting out a persona, an avatar. You have friends on there. You have your guild or your group or whatever it's called in that particular game and you're on a quest, you're on a mission of some kind and you're living out some sort of fantasy and you're, you're just looking at a screen. It's not yet immersive like that, but it's so immersive mentally, spiritually and with your time. Social media, I get on there and that's my social life, right? Right? And I get the likes and I interact with this person and that person back and forth. And I'm on there more than I'm with actual people. That's what we've been talking about in the past with the media on the brain and the media mind. What's coming next with the metaverse is this new normal where it's the new place that they want to induct people where they are going to live. People are spending tens of thousands of dollars for property in the metaverse already now. The people who are on the cutting edge of that uh, as an investment or to have their own little chunk of the metaverse that's going to be built by this mega corporation. Put not your trust in corporate princes either. What Klaus Schwab refers to, I think we can play this one. I think this one's short enough. Let's play this. It's Klaus Schwab saying, what is the fourth industrial revolution? Now, actually, before we play it, guys, you're setting it up. That's great. Um, the first industrial revolution, of course, was the early steam-powered, machine-based industry from 200 plus years ago. Then it transitioned to electricity in the late 19th, early 20th centuries. And then the th you could say that's the second industrial revolution. And then the third industrial revolution, that which involves the worldwide superhighway, the internet, okay? They're saying there's a fourth industrial revolution right on the horizon here. And it's going to involve this meta idea. They say in other clips that I don't have time to show you today that by 2030, the smartphone will no longer be the most prominent interface for utilizing the internet, that these things will be wired into our bodies and our thoughts can think into the cloud and we will be involved in that metaverse or an augmented reality, AR versus virtual reality, VR. VR is totally immersed, you're in a completely different place. Augmented reality would be I can still go about this actual planet Earth God made, and, but, but there are digital things happening all around me here and there that I can click on or that I can a portal to go into here and then come back or whatever. So he's talking about the fourth industrial revolution as the president of the World Economic Forum. And here's what he says. It's at the end what, what the fourth industrial revolution will lead to is a fusion of our physical, our digital, and our biological identities. So I'll leave that for now, maybe another time. But this new normal... Um, includes labor, uh, which includes AI for manual labor. That's something else we'll pick up another time. But I found this little snippet on the World Government Summit page to be interesting as well. They refer to the fraying of social fabric, the fraying of the social fabric, due to largely so much online interaction, losing the family and the church and the real thing. Uh, they say it's exasperated by inequality. And they refer to the spread of fake news on digital platforms as, the, uh, as well as the rise of populism, intolerance, and extremism. Governments must lead the way with better regulation and foster global dialogue on human values, identity, faith, and other things. So faith, new faiths will be emerging out of this. Secularism is actually on the decline. Harari speaks of this, the scholar guy earlier who was saying we can have climate change use the same methods as we did for COVID. He talks 
talks about how the idea of uh, biblical or, or, or religious uh, authority, you go to God and God says, thou shalt, thou shalt not, and I obey because it's God. He said that was one way in, in, in the orthodox way. And then we moved in the 20th century into liberalism, which is basically do what thou wilt, whatever you would like to do and as your, meets your preference. There is no authority other than your own self. What you find is a pleasure to you. He says that is going to give way to the complete surrender to the wisdom of the algorithm. When we put all of our data online and our psychological profile that Big Tech has of us knows us better than our spouse knows us, at that point, we can entrust them to make better decisions for us than we can make for ourselves. And so we will, he says, new faiths will be coming out of Silicon Valley, the literal worship of these power, powerful brain, super brains Ray Kurzweil refers to it as the age of spiritual machines. What does he mean by that? Well, I find it interesting that you're familiar probably with this Renaissance era famous painting, not an endorsement of the, the Romanist origins of that, but in the popular collective mind, it's our, in our consciousness, we go, ah, God and man, God's creation of man, with the finger of what is supposed to be God there artistically presented where Adam little limp there and being created by God. So you got God on the right, Adam on the left, straight finger, limp finger. Now decode this for me, would you? You talk about spiritual machines here. It's been, which finger is on the right now, the limp finger or the straight finger? The limp finger. So who's the limp finger is man. So man is in the position of God. We're on the right. And our creation is AI. So we are creators, counterfeit creators. There's so much more on this. They announce this. They say we are, we are going beyond the creator of the Bible because we can create silicon beings that are even better than biological beings. And then the robotic AI has a straight finger. So maybe the AI is looked to as a, the authority, is worshipped as a god. And I have Silicon Valley people who are coming out and saying we've founded churches on this and we, we will have to Look to this AI as something of a superior deity. Yuval Noah Harari says this, history began when humans invented gods, and history will end when humans become gods. So this is not rhetoric. This isn't reading into their statements. He just comes out and says it. Um, clip of Harari. What is he going to say here? Uh, you know, yeah, let's, let's roll this one. This is an important one. Let's do, let's do that one. Homo sapiens is the only animal that can talk about things that don't really exist. Churches are rooted in common religious myth about God and heaven. States are rooted in common national myths. Business corporations are rooted in common economic myth about money, stocks, and the corporations themselves. Judicial systems are also rooted in myth, in common legal myth about justice and human rights. Yet, in truth, there are no God in the universe, no nations, no corporations, no money, and no human rights, and no justice outside the common imagination of us human beings. He says it again. Sorry, that was a little loud. He the says fact it again. is that there is no such thing in the world as gods, or money, or human rights, except in the common imagination of human beings. Um... False. We know that biblically there is such a thing as the creator God because how did everything come into existence? How is prophecy able to foretell the future? We know that there is a supernatural mind and power and intelligence behind everything. That's ir- it's irrefutable. It's taken for granted. It's step one in every form of reasoning we engage in. It has to be assumed or we wouldn't be able to reason. Um, but what he said there was very frightening. He said the idea of nationhood, of human rights, is a myth. Like, you know an atheist is going to say there's no God. That didn't surprise me. But I was sitting under professors and scholars who were, you know, agnostic or atheists, and they would be the biggest champions of human rights that you'd find out there. They had that liberal humanitarian impulse. And I, I aligned with it to certain extents in certain ways, in certain contexts. I would say, yeah, you know, we need to be concerned about that type of development in society that's taking human rights away. Now the elite scholars, the intelligentsia are saying, 
There are no human rights. That's what I'm talking about when we're transitioning out of the era of secular liberalism into this new technocratic philosophy. We're going to view this as the good old days because this was at least people you can coexist with. Nobody's trying to force anything on any, anybody else unless it's a Marxist, you know, intolerant society or you've got a religious orthodox society that's intolerant. Both of these could go rogue and become authoritarian. But you can have religious people and secularism, secular people coexisting in a plural society in America and everybody respects each other's freedoms and we're good. But when you transition out of that to no, 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 we're going to impose the values from this system upon people, then you have a whole different story altogether. Building the cities of the future. Oh yeah, this is a big one. We wanted to touch on country living this afternoon in addition to religious liberty and current events and prophecy. Um, building cities of the future is one of the world government summit's agendas. Did anybody ever come across this very eye-opening and interesting World Economic Forum tweet and article? Welcome to 2030. I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better. This kind of went viral, right, for the last six years, and people have talked about it again and again. Welcome to 2030. I own nothing, have no privacy, and life has never been better. Here's the article by the World Economic Forum in Forbes. And there's, there's the headline, similar to what we just read in the tweet. Welcome to the year 2030. Welcome to my city. Or should I say, our city. I don't own anything. I don't own a car. I don't own a house. I don't own any appliances or any clothes. So you ready for the mega city, sci-fi, dystopian future? It might seem odd to you, but it makes perfect sense for us in this city. Everything you considered a product has now become a service. We have access to transportation, accommodation, food, and all the things we need in our daily lives. One by one, all these things became free, so it ended up not making sense for us to own much. Transportation <clears throat> dropped dramatically in price. It made no sense for us to own cars anymore because we could call a driverless vehicle or fly or a flying car, car for longer journeys within minutes. We started transporting ourselves in a much more organized and coordinated way when public transport became easier, quicker, and more convenient than the car. Now, I can hardly believe that we accepted congestion and traffic jams, not to mention the air pollution from combustion engines. What were we thinking? In our city, we don't pay any rent because someone else is using our free space whenever we don't need it. My living room is used for business meetings when I am not there. What? <laughs> Once in a while, I will choose to cook for myself. It is easy. The, kitchen, the necessary kitchen equipment is delivered at my door within minutes. Shopping? By the way, we have some counsel on cooking. Uh, we want to be cooking and cooking healthy food. Shopping? I can't really remember what that is. For most of us, it has been turned into choosing things to use. Sometimes I find this fun, and sometimes I just want the algorithm to do it for me. It knows my tastes better than I do by now. When AI and robots took over so much of our work, we suddenly had time to eat well, sleep well, and spend time with other people. Now, is that how human nature typically operates? <laughs> you give me a permanent vacation, and I'm going to eat healthy food and be a really like wholesome person. Yeah, that's a little bit optimistic, I think. Once in a while, I get annoyed about the fact that I have no real privacy. She goes on with that. But then it's, it's all in all, it's a good life. And, I, and then the, these terrible things were happening, like environmental degradation in our cities have solved the problem. And the World Economic Forum says, it sounds utopian. I think when most liberty-loving, and i.e. human beings who like choice and freedom for their families, which is every human being is a liberty yearning for a human a person made in the image of God, created with three free will, when you hear that, you, you don't naturally say, that sounds like a beautiful utopian future. You usually would look at that and say, that is a dystopic sci-fi scenario, the likes of which I've never heard, and they're actually announcing it in mainstream publications. Here's how one scholar summed it up. He said, the World Economic Forum envisions a biotechno-feudalist global order with socioeconomic planners and corporate stakeholders at the helm and the greater part of humanity in their thrall. The mass of humanity, the planners would have it, will live under an economic stasis of reduced expectations. We can't allow these nations to grow and industrialize. 
with, with individual autonomy greatly curtailed, if not utterly obliterated. That's been a bunch of slides on the World Economic Forum. Bringing it back to Revelation 13 and remembering that little horn power of Daniel 7, when you search in the World Economic Forum search bar the word Pope, do you see how many articles come up? 1,680. This is, this is his World Economic Forum. Now, what is the biggest concern? Here's the, re- the last part of that article. The biggest concern, this is where country living comes in. The biggest concern of the World Economic Forum is, <clears throat> my biggest concern is all the people who do not live in our city. So those who opt out, those who don't want to be under the thumb of the technocracy, who feel compulsions of conscience to raise their children according to God's order, she calls them the lost those we lost along on the way, those who decided that it became too much, all this technology, those who felt obsolete and useless when robots and AI took over big parts of our jobs, those who get upset with the political system and turned against it. We don't have to do that part. They live different kinds of lives outside the city. I hope we do that. I hope we do that part. Some have formed little self-supplying communities. Others just stayed in the empty and abandoned houses in small 19th century villages. So yeah, wow. The biggest concern of the World Economic Forum is country living. That is eye-opening to me. Speaking of country living, have you ever read this? The question has been asked, you know, should God's people be in the country or have country places that we can go to? Um, is, is, Is now the time? I want to show you a couple quotes, and I want to do them chronologically. Uh, This has been done before, but it bears re-emphasis for a generation who may not quite understand the country living message. In Testimonies, Volume 5, in 1885, it said, the time is not far distant. When, like the early disciples, we shall be forced to seek a refuge in desolate and solitary places. As the siege of Jerusalem by the Roman armies was the signal for flight for the Judean Christians, so the assumption of power on the part of our nation in the decree enforcing the papal Sabbath will be a warning to us. It will then be time to leave the large cities preparatory to leaving the smaller ones for retired homes and secluded places among the mountains. And now, instead of seeking expensive dwellings here, we should be preparing to move to a better country, even a heavenly. Instead of spending our means in self-gratification, we should be studying to economize. Is that some good advice? That's good advice there. Economize and prepare for a better country and heavenly. Um, So that was giving you, like, time is not far distant where we're going to be looking at this. And in, 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 this was stated in 1885, but some have taken that quote to simply mean that the country living message only applies after the Sunday law. If you were to read only that quote, you might, you might get that idea. Read the whole book, Country Living. Uh, and it's something, it's a neglected topic among God's people. I was speaking at a church on living the life of Enoch once. And I said, there's this wonderful book, Country Living. How many of you have read the book, Country Living? I won't do it to you because I'm telling this story. No, nobody's hand went up. Uh, there was one family that we were especially good friends with that we had practiced country living with together. Their hands went up, but they were the only ones in the whole congregation who had read country living. So read it, read it. It's a good book. It's a compilation. Compilations are great. I hope I didn't leave the impression earlier with the 10. These are the 10. You know, there's, there's great compilations too. Um, 1903 says, the time has come. 1885, 1903, the time has come. When, as God opens the way, families should move out of the cities. As God opens the way. The children should be taken out into the country. The parents should get a suitable place as their means will allow. Though the dwelling may be small, yet there should be land in connection with it that may be cultivated. The time has come. Now, you heard the reference to children. You might say, that applies maybe only to families with children. Could be. Um, 1904. Again and again, the Lord has instructed that our people are to take their families away from the cities into the country where they are to raise their own provisions. So that was here, land to be cultivated. Do you think food uh, cultivation, food prices, food scarcity, um, food crises are a real issue in the last days? We're seeing it this year, aren't we? Uh, We had a president of the United States saying food shortages are going to be real. I've never heard a president say that before in America, in the land of plenty. In 1904, again and again, the Lord has instructed our people, no reference to children this time, to take their families away from cities into the country where they can raise their own provisions. That's the emphasis there, is the raising of our own provisions. Everybody needs to eat. For in the future, the problem of buying and selling will be a very serious one. We should now begin to heed the instruction given us over and over again. 
Get out of the cities into rural districts where the houses are not crowded closely together and where you will be free from the interference of enemies. So I, I recommend the book, not, not a few just quotations on the screen, but a personal individual study of this matter to come to an understanding of God's will. Um, it's, it sounds kind of radical, I realize that, like, in the context of this you know, 2030 thing out there. You know, we're like, oh, wait a minute, 1904. Again and again, the Lord has said it's time to do that. Um, my wife and I moved into the country, and we had people who were like, you guys have gone fanatical. What, you're going to hate it. You're, you're going to be back in Grand Rapids in no time. Two years. I give you two years. <laughs> and my wife said to a friend, just read it. And, and, and you tell me what, what you think. And she read it, and she's like, yeah, you're right. We're supposed to be moving to the country. So uh, that, that's, that's for each individual to be impressed by God themselves, not for any man to declare. But um, <clears throat> you heard the part here about raising our own provisions. And I've, I've often heard it commented on that um, we ought not do that type of physical, practical preparedness because it is a signal of lack of faith. Um, that could be. Somebody could be reliant solely on their stored food and solely on their seeds and their land and their ability to grow their food. And if there's no faith in it and there's no power of God in it, yes, that is a lack of faith. But is the very act of agriculture, which is called the A, B's, and C's of true education, is that, an, is that a lack of faith? Um, not, not in and of itself. It's, a, it's an obedience issue. If God put Adam and Eve in the garden and he loves the country living concept all through the Old Testament with the patriarchs and the young people being raised in that, in that uh, patriarchal type of environment, um, not necessarily a lack of faith, but it could be. Um, so it could be having food that's canned or dried food, you know, you, that could be one's faith, that could be one's reliance and their, their confidence, their security. If our security is in our bank account, that is a lack of faith. Does that mean a bank account is bad? Of course not. Um, same thing with stored food. The Lord has shown me in vision repeatedly that it is contrary to the Bible to make any provision for our temporal wants in the time of trouble. There's two different issues here, aren't there? Here it's saying make provision for your temporal wants. So do these contradict? Make provision for your temporal wants. The Lord has shown me that it's contrary to make provision for your temporal wants in the time of trouble. So if I'm going, well, there's a time coming with the Sunday law and there's you know, the final events and the mark of the beast and the enforcement of that. I'm going to be dug into my bunker. Um, if you're making preparations for the time of trouble, that is contrary to the Bible. I saw that if the saints had food laid up by them or in the fields in the time of trouble, when sword, famine, and pestilence are in the land, pestilence, that's diseases, it will be taken from them by violent hands and strangers would reap their fields. Then will be the time for us to trust wholly in God. He will sustain us. In the time of trouble, there is no preparedness. There is no uh, country living in that sense of the word. We are in the country, but not at our, at, at our own uh, labor. God will be providing for us. Bread and water will be sure at that time. And we should not lack or suffer hunger. The Lord has shown me that some of his children would fear when they see the price of food rising. Oh, isn't that relevant right now? <laughs> the price of food is going to rise. Another prophecy fulfilled. Are there people right now storing food for the time of trouble? Potentially. It says it's going to happen, and the Lord is not pleased with that. Is it wrong to have food stored? How about this? Back then, everybody had the winter's food stored up before the winter came. It would be foolish and presumptuous to not. So that's a very prudent, normal human thing to do that humans have done for thousands of years is to have a year's supply of food on hand and the seeds for the next year. But um, storing up for the time of trouble, we're called to not do. So this is what has gotten people confused. They say, you're not supposed to do country living and grow food and prepare and have stored food. That's against Bible religion. I heard it in Spirit of Prophecy. Yes, but that is referencing to the time of trouble. There is a period preceding that. It's going to be filled with worms and full of living creatures not filled for you, fit for use if we are engaged in that. In the last great conflict of the controversy with Satan, those who are loyal to God will see every earthly support cut off. So we will not be able to sustain on our gardens. Because they refuse to break his law in obedience to earthly powers, they will be forbidden to buy or sell. It will finally be decreed that they shall be put to death. But to the obedient is given the promise, he shall dwell on high. His place of defense shall be the munitions of the rocks. Bread shall be given him. His waters shall be sure. So what and when are we preparing for? Uh, current times? 
whatever this world throws at us with crazy economic fluctuations, more importantly, just being in the country to hear the voice of God and be in the presence of him in nature and the development and the benefit that that brings us spiritually. And then we work the cities from outposts is the blueprint model. But we got the idea here, in the time of trouble, in the time of trouble, then it will be that you are not to be storing food but in, in, in last day events, there's a heading called the little time of trouble. Read that section. There's a time preceding the time of trouble called the little time of trouble. And that we're going to really want to, uh, to be practically prepared for. Hence the counsel at the beginning here about us raising our own provisions, buying and selling will be difficult, getting into rural districts, and so on. Um, and you saw it here as well with the benefits of such a place. But we need to take a break. I'm not yet done with this presentation. This is the first time we've done this one. 136 slides, and we made it 118 out of 136. Not too shabby in an hour and a half presentation. You need a break. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you so much for an opportunity to ponder these things and pause and discuss, and we thank you for Q&A later after the 4 o'clock message, and thank you for the opportunity to abide with you all day and seek your will on these difficult things. And We know they're simple to you, and you'll make them clear to us. In Jesus' name, amen. We'll see you at 4 o'clock, 10 minutes.